Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this month's Star Life session brought to you by The Star together with Ramsey Saim Darby and R. Damansara Medical Center. I'm Calvin from Star Media Group and thank you for joining us here today this Saturday morning. A few quick housekeeping rules, please switch your phones to silent and please save any questions you have for the Q&A session after the talk. Before we begin, allow me to share what Star Live is about. As a way of connecting with you, our readers, the Star presents an exciting array of talk sessions covering various topical matters of interest, including guides to leading a healthier lifestyle. Today's session, Keeping Your Heart Healthy, is about coronary artery disease, which is one of the leading causes of death in Malaysia. Our guest speakers will be sharing some insight on the disease and how to prevent it. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Zubin Ofman Ibrahim, consultant cardiologist and physician, up onto the stage. Okay, thank you very much, uh, good morning. I am always surprised to see that on a Saturday morning the, the crowd is, 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 is here. I think it just shows how, how useful these sessions are. So we'll go straight away to my favorite subject, which is CAD, coronary artery disease. This is mainly what happens when the heart vessels uh, it, you know, are blocked or they become very narrowed and they cause either symptoms or disease. Yeah? And how exercise is is a main way how we can help patients with this, and even uh, to prevent heart disease from exercise. Okay, so when some of you are parents here, when your when your kids come back from the exams and uh, results, and uh, you know they show you a few A's, five A's for their SPM or something. This is not mine, I'm not that healthy, but these are my patients. So occasionally some of them, they bring back to me in clinic you know, their medals. Okay, and this is from uh, either the half marathon, the Ironman, and one, one of them was actually a patient who had a heart attack and they gave him, and he gave me his, 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 running, his running numbers. And I think for some of you here who, who, who run, you know, and the medal or the, uh, the numbers is something big for them, and you can see some of your friends with with uh, a whole a whole shelf of those medals. And I think something uh, which which we feel quite nice if we get uh, see a thank you note or something on flowers. And this this really made my day. So this is my patients, and they pass me their medals you know, to us. Just just a small word of thanks. Uh, I'll try and do something a bit different this time. I'll show you how. As doctors, we learn the disease. We, d we don't just look at the books and we look at patients and how these patients have uh, the extra kind of information that, that we can uh, learn from them. So the first one is, I'll just show you uh, one of our, my recent patients. 51, he's very healthy, apart from just having uh, some high cholesterol. He runs what, one or two half marathons per year, but then he comes to see us in clinic and he says, I can't do my usual 5-10K. Who can do a usual 5-10K? You know, so it's, it's, it's a big difference. And he's been getting all these chest pains uh, for the last few days. Yeah. And just this point here, you can see that this black thing here is where the contrast goes in the heart vessel. And if you, if you don't see... Uh, where this black contrast is, that's where the narrowing or the blockage is. And, and we normally have three vessels that we, yeah. that we talk about, and he's got quite significant narrowing in two vessels, yeah. over here and here. So this was pretty straightforward. He had symptoms, his exercise was limited from these blocks, and we just, uh, and we just sorted it out. So he had two stents. We don't stent everybody. Okay, but we know that if somebody has got significant symptoms, it's more than 80, 90 percent, and it's you know, he's he's still very young. Okay, 50 is young, 93 is the new 60. Okay, <laughs> so you know he, he still wants to run. Okay, so we just have to make sure that we do what we can for this patient. Okay, so this is person A, this is person B. 44 male, he may be a doctor, for example. 
non-smoker. The only exercise that he did was maybe when he when he when he last had a you know a run during during his med school, for example. Okay, his BMI is raised, BP is already high, and what do you think? Which which patient or which person is more healthy, the one who just had the heart attack? or this person who's 44 years old and has multiple risk factors. I'll talk about this later. So just, this is just as a start, just to think about you know, the kind of patients that we are having, and some are at a stage where they already have disease, and a lot of them, after a heart attack, after something like bypass surgery, for example, they become healthier than what they were before the attack. And this is through either treatment, but to their work, with a bit more exercise, stopping the cigarettes if they do stop, and then trying to reverse whatever kind of disease that they may have. Okay. <coughs> this one of my trips to India. We had a walk up to the, you know, the Ladakh Valley. This 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 man is the guy who um, who who brought all the ponies and the horses around the track, and it was a whole ten day track. He's about eighty nine, I think. 89 years old, he looks 89. Uh, you know, when every morning, uh, sorry, every day when we come to these camps, uh, these horses will be let out, and uh, these horses will go up and down the valleys and the hills with a, within a radius of 10 to 20 you know, kilometers. And while we are nicely sleeping in the in the in the in the stands. Uh, around three o'clock in the morning, he goes out to look for them again, and he does another walk through a radius of 10, 20 k's, and comes back for us to be ready to go for the next next journey. And it, we will go at two hours ahead of the horses, and halfway you will see this this guy, Uncle Tashi, just overtake us slowly. So re really weakling Malaysians trying to uh, do things, and we have this old guy really outdoing us okay so this is just easy easy example of somebody who's really active uh, he, he's never stepped in a gym before okay <laughs> he doesn't need a gym so his work makes him healthy yeah <coughs> okay so this topic will talk about four broad things one is prevention uh, how does exercise do that after a heart attack or a heart bypass, what can we do? Somebody with heart failure. Heart failure is the end stage of all heart disease, whether it's been treated well or it's just been, been too uh, severe to be treated. And what kind of exercise? Maybe the last one is the most uh, useful thing. I'm not too sure. If there's any questions that you really want to ask now, then maybe you can allow one or two. <coughs> Okay, before you go to the first uh, section, this is what we are talking about. All of us probably knows uh, what happens with, with, with age and cholesterol and all the other risk factors. But what we don't seem to understand is this. <coughs> this, is a, this is a picture of a plastinated heart. That means it's uh, somebody's heart. Um, and uh, you know, resin and plastic has been infused in the blood vessels. And after a while, all the muscle is being, I'm not too sure how they remove the muscles, okay? But when, when doctors talk about the heart vessels, we talk about one, two, three, four blood vessels, but this is how extensive it is, okay? The heart itself is a huge muscle. It works every day, every second, until the heart stops. But just, just think about the heart vessels itself, okay? And it's not just a stiff pipe, it's a living organ. The, those heart vessels itself is, is living. So whatever we do to our, to our body, and certainly there are changes. The same, the same way how, how these blood vessels affect our legs, our, our brains, our eyes, our skin. Just imagine how much good exercise can be and how much things like uh, physical inactivity just by sitting around on the couch every day. So this is how much we have to deal with. Okay? Quite impressive. <coughs> okay, we've got enough data, we've got enough scientific facts, we've got enough research in the last 50, 60 years, uh, so many guidelines from our own uh, National Heart Association, we've got guidelines from Europe and US. It's, it's very clear that exercise directly and indirectly will prevent 
heart disease. Of course, we have patients who have got uh, genes which would say that how we process, uh, say, cholesterol, for example, is, is faulty. We can't go away from our genes. But I think when we look at all our doctors and, and all the associations, we know that exercise does a lot of good. And it happens at an early stage. If somehow at the age of 40, 45, we've, we've left exercise f for a while, there are evidence that shows that if we start again, then we can reverse whatever lifestyle changes that we've not done. And uh, you know, the one, one interesting uh, study that, that was done around the 60s, um, uh, what they did was to look at uh, five or 10 healthy young American men, and they made them lie down on the bed for three weeks. Okay, three weeks. Huh? I don't know how you do that, but for three weeks. <coughs> and then after three weeks, they had a look at their heart. They see how the heart functioned, how the heart elasticity was, and how the heart pump was, and they made sure they re-exercised again. Okay, and they showed clearly that after uh, a period of inactivity, and where the, patient, where the person does not do anything at all, uh, the heart regresses in its function. And after a good one month of rehab or exercising, the hearts went back to normal. The interesting is 30 years after that, 1990s, the same researchers and maybe the same group, they looked at these, these patients and they were already 60 plus years old. And their, and their heart health and the, how the heart functions at the age of 60, 60 plus, was similar to how it was after three weeks of not doing anything. So after three weeks of vegetating on a bed, similar changes to getting old in 30 years. Okay, we don't know exactly why there's, there's lots of uh, research done for that. We seem to understand a bit, but certainly not all. So just by not doing anything is as bad as aging, I, I won't say bad, lah, huh? aging is good, you guys are all healthy people here. Okay? If you I, think, I think you all understand, yeah? Okay? And this is, this is done uh, at, at centers where they looked exactly how the heart works. Right? So yeah, so this is what we need to do. We, most of us know how much we need to exercise, what does it mean, uh, you know, the intensity, moderate intensity, vigorous intensity, um, do more if you can, do more when you can, certainly push yourself to do more, especially if you are aiming for certain things. Yeah? And if you can't do 150 minutes per week, then do as much as you can. Even small increases in what we are doing now certainly improves our health, our heart health. How the heart pumps, lowering the blood pressure. And again, just by having sedentary uh, not lifestyle, but just behaviors. So uh, relying on the remote too much, for example, that's one example that was given. Just taking one flight of stairs, uh, but you know what I mean? One flight of stairs and you take the lift. So they've shown that for, for people who don't exercise, for people who don't exercise, their daily life is also unhealthy. That means they don't walk, they don't maybe cook, or they don't uh, do housework enough. So try to understand that somebody who is fit and healthy with, with a healthy heart, the whole, the whole day is filled with activity, filled with moving around. Okay? Uh, one heart specialist told us uh, that, that, that you know, if you see your kid uh, kind of fidgeting around on the desk, if teachers see their, their students you know, moving their fingers, don't, don't tell them to stop. That may be a sign that they are uh, that's the usual kind of way of trying to burn calories without exercise. Okay, there's, there's some research on that. Okay. okay, let's just go back to what levels do we mean by sedentary behavior, just vegetating in front of the TV, playing games, uh, the only exercise that you do will be your, your fingers and thumb. You know, light exercise, slow walking, cooking, housework, it, it does count, okay? Especially if that's where we are at a, at a certain stage of our lives. Uh, you know, we are, we are, there's, there's 24 hours that we have, uh, six hours maybe sleeping, and the rest is, 
you know, just doing our daily chores, working, the kind of work that we do. Are we somebody who sits on the desk the whole day at office? Or do we have a slightly more active way of doing things? Go to see our mates, go and see the boss up, upstairs, for example. Go to the, the cafeteria to make some coffee for our friends. So just being active on our feet without formal exercise is also useful. Yeah? And what does it mean by having uh, exercise which is either vigorous or maybe moderate in intensity? A good way is when we run or when we cycle, if we have a friend next to us, if we are still able to talk to them. Okay, that's kind of moderate intensity. Okay? If when we exercise and then uh, when we push ourselves, we can't, we can't seem to uh, finish our sentence, that's kind of vigorous activity. That's, that's a rough way of, of, of doing things. Yeah? Uh, it can be a bit too technical looking at how many percent is, is, is our heart rate. But mo some of us with, with your, your Fitbits and things may understand that uh, you have your age target or your heart rate, maybe 220 minus your age. So let's say I'm 45, uh, 220 will be around 175. That will be my max. So reach around 80% for vigorous exercise, high intensity, and maybe about 60%, so around 130, 120. Okay. Walking is good, but if you are healthy, 45 years old, no joint pains, no ankle, ankle arthritis, we should do more. Yeah, we should we certainly do more. I do see there's a bit more over 50s in this group, uh, which is good, but I'm a bit worried that the younger ones may not be here because somehow in my practice, a lot of my younger ones are unhealthy. No joke. Okay, uh, the only exercise that they do is the occasional golf, uh, you know, walking. And, and when you're 40, 45, golf may not be enough. Okay, um, when you're 60, th that's okay. Okay, but then because we're living in KL, we've got a, we've got a big job. We've got a job which, which makes us you know, successful with our training and we are in charge of something. Then this job makes us go away from healthy exercise. And this is something which, which people in KL need to sort out now. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's clear that exercise can, can prevent uh, uh, heart disease and through the, the, uh, the, the measures uh, to the heart itself. And obviously, if we are exercising, we can prevent diabetes, prevent hypertension, and if we do have diabetes and hypertension, exercise does control it in a way that it will prevent further progression of heart disease. Okay, after a heart attack, after a bypass, can we exercise? Okay, the answer is yes. Uh, it will depend on how healthy we are kind of before the heart attack. While somebody is having chest pain, for example, in the hospital, we, as doctors, we do ask, what's your normal level of activity, normal level of exercise? If he's had, uh, uh, say, a heart attack, and we know that they are still very healthy, as in they run uh, you know, five Ks every day, then certainly we know that's where our aim will be in the next two weeks or one month after a heart attack. If somebody has been very unwell for a long time, for six years, five years, and not doing anything at all for a long time, then we know that's where our targets are. So our targets will depend on, on how healthy we are. All of you guys, most of you guys walked here, maybe up the stairs. So all are quite uh, safe for us to have a target if somebody gets a heart attack to reach that target within two weeks or one month. Okay. Um, after a heart attack, you know, it, it really uh, reduces the chance of getting a second heart attack. Get back, you know, the heart goes back to a normal function. And with treatment, even though we've opened the vessels, for example, all of, the, all of that extra flow will only be meaningful if we are using the heart. Okay? And there's plenty of, ex uh, of research on uh, how cardiac rehab works. And there's a, there's a quarter chance of, of, of reducing your chance of another uh, heart attack or heart death if we do rehab after a heart attack or bypass. And in most good centers now, if we plan for treatment, there's always uh, 
a referral to the cardiac rehab team. If we just focus on the treatment, the OBAT, the medication, and we just leave the, the patient on, on their own without getting a, a clear plan, then we've not done enough. Okay, so it's very clear that uh, rehab works, even uh, in states and here, it is also covered by insurance, for example. Okay, so that's how important it is. Okay, I won't go through all of this one by one, but again, all the physiological studies, all, all, the, uh, all the physical things that we see from exercise, there is a scientific explanation for it, and we see it multiple times, and it can be replicated in uh, young patients, in older patients, and even somebody who has not got any uh, things like say hypertension, they may still have some problems because of the physical inactivity before a heart attack. And all of this is recruited after doing exercise. All of this is improved after going on a clear kind of pathway to get a better uh, health. So the cardiac rehab that we have uh, really depends on, on, on what the centers have, but it starts off as baseline assessments and then we talk about the food, uh, talk about if they have hypertension, they need to be treated. So it's done with doctors, done with nurses and the technicians and the physio. Uh, and it's not just putting you on the treadmill, but it's thinking about the, the physical, the psychological things as well. In the end, it's exercise training to improve the level of your physical activity to a level where we can say, yes, after a heart attack, six months, 12 months, you've already reached one level where it is as good as sometimes even better than what you were. And if anything happens and uh, you know, you say, I've been able to do three Ks every day, but now I can't. So, so now we know that there is already some change in the function and then we need to act and, and see what uh, is wrong now. Yeah? And this is just an example of all the things that we have at the hospital. Uh, this thing here is an anti-gravity machine where somebody with maybe uh, bad knees or bad, uh, bad hips still is able to be, to be gone through the motions. Okay? And uh, just have to make sure that we are able to, to cater for all, all kind of patients. We know that uh, the referral to cardiac rehab is, is quite poor. It should be 70-80%. It's only at 10 10 to 15 percent worldwide, or maybe less in Malaysia. Okay. Heart failure, as I said just now, is uh, the end stage of all heart disease. It can be vulvar heart disease, it can be heart rhythms gone wrong, hypertension can cause heart failure, and block vessels. So if it's not kind of treated well, the heart becomes dilated. For example, there's a heart attack here, and this area of the muscle is not functioning, so the heart and balloons out, and that that area of the heart is not pumping well, and you, you may have some family members or you may have some friends who, uh, you know, they can't talk uh, fast because their lungs are not uh, okay. They can't walk properly, even one flight of stairs because their lungs are full of fluid. They've got uh, swelling of their legs, and this is from fluid accumulation, and this is all because of heart failure. Even somebody with advanced heart failure, exercise does help. We, we certainly understand that they may not reach a level where they were uh, 15 years ago or maybe kind of before the heart attack, but any amount of improvement will recruit all of those heart muscles and, and make the heart relearn how to deal with all of these this, this, this inefficiencies. Even the muscle improves uh, how they receive oxygen and how they use oxygen and blood if we go through a clear program of improving their, their physical activity. So even with heart failure. Okay. Somebody with heart failure, obviously they are a bit more uh, sicker compared to uh, somebody without any heart failure. But there are clear kind of barriers to this. A lot of patients with heart failure may have some mood problems, some depression for example. And you know, but but we know that in patients who are willing to go through all of this, yes, they do have some improvement in, in what they can do. Okay, and this is actually the last bit. Okay. What kind of exercise can I do after a heart attack or if I want to improve my heart? What kind of, and how do we start? 
uh, can exercise be dangerous? I mean, we've, we've heard of uh, occasional you know, reports in the newspapers that too much exercise can be dangerous. Okay, too much excess can be dangerous physically if you break things. Yeah, this uh, used to play a bit more uh, active contact sports. This is about two years ago, and uh, you know, for the heart, I mean, there's 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 enough evidence that if we stay within the limits of our physical abilities, it's safe. But you know, I can't avoid these things if I bang into somebody, lah. Yeah. Okay, but yes, it is safe. Uh, we know that the physical activity that we do does depend on our mobility, our back is, is supple enough, our, our arms is strong enough, our knees are they okay, do we have arthritis, our weight, we can't ask somebody to go run a mile or two if they are say 15 or 20 kilos overweight, we have to start slowly. Uh, there are some potential harms if we go really overboard, and these are patients who these are these are people who uh, who go for these ultra uh, races, 100 k's, 150 k's across Africa, for example, or they swim around Langkawi Island. We have we have people, we have friends like that, and there's there seems to be uh, th there seems to be a kind of limit to where the body can do. And we're only understanding that now, but most of us, or maybe all of us here, will probably not do any of those things. Okay, so we should be safe. Anything in between is all right. Okay? So as long as you're not uh, doing too much, and what is too much, it depends on all of these things, our age, our physical activity, what do we have, hypertension and knees. And it makes sense that the problem is not too much exercise. Most of us, the whole country, the whole world, the problem is too little. Yeah, so let's, let's not be, be too concerned about that at this stage. It's a major area of study, and we need to know more about this. Okay, so in, 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 in the slides, I tried to just uh, look for some, some pictures of, of some healthy people running. But running men, that's not the running men I was looking for. Uh, what, <laughs> how to start, we actually have to look for simple things. Okay, so start slowly. Uh, if it's just walking that we can do, start walking. It can be in the taman, it can be in the, in the, in the, in the jungle, for example. This is in Kota Damansara. There, there is a, there's a, there's community, uh, and a forest there. It, it's, it's nice. It's not too high. The incline is not too great, and it's quite fun. Okay, just, just, just avoid taking too many selfies, uh, and do the actual walking. And this, this, this guy is, is. So there's two things. One would be your aerobics exercise, your usual uh, slow running, jogging, walking, and your swimming and your cycling. This is the kind of exercise where you're moving, your muscles are moving, and you're not, uh, you're not going against some resistance. The second exercise on the, on the right, on your left, sorry, on your right, is, is you know, resistance training. So this is going against resistance, holding your muscles and joints in a certain way and with some weight. So it seems that it's clear now with, ev with the science that we have, we have to do both at any age. Okay? And even though we're 80, 93, we still need to do some resistance training. And the resistance training we do at a certain age may just be some Tai Chi, for example. And that's resistance training, trying to get out from a certain position. That's, that could be enough for an older person. Uh, there are plenty of people who can't do squats. That's a form of resistance training as well. Going upstairs, if, if that's the only thing that we can do, that is resistance for us. Slowly going upstairs. But depending on what we can do, we have to do both. Okay? So some gym work. This, this picture is just somebody using a barbell, just a barbell without the weight. So that's only that's about five kilos, I think. Or, yeah, five kilos. Any age, okay. Any age, okay. And uh, uh, there might be friends. It might be husband and wife. I think it's a bit more fun if you bring your if you bring your partner. Uh, safety issue as well. You're not your eyes are not roving. Keep hydrated, but certain, <laughs> but not not uh, not a cocktail like this lady is doing, okay. But you know, it's it's very important for us to to make sure that we do all of this and we understand it both. The other thing is, so you have the, 
the aerobics exercise, the usual thing that we do, people uh, see that we do uh, the running, the swimming and the cycling, then we have the resistance training, but we also have the balance, uh, where you look for the balance and and the the the, the, the agility of somebody. So s e even things like Tai Chi is important. That prevents falls. Okay, so uh, one major problem in somebody who is not healthy enough, where the heart isn't working, they don't do the exercise. And from here, yes, even the Mat Saleh agrees. Harvard has done plenty of research on, on things like Tai Chi. So it does work, yeah? And just remember, with all the exercise that we do, we can't outrun a bad diet. Okay, so even though you, you, you've done your run, you can't celebrate too much with, with, the, with the roti chanai afterwards. Be reasonable, okay? Be very reasonable. Sports drinks are, are probably not... Yeah, sports drinks are bad, I think. Okay, just plain water should be, should be enough, yeah? Okay, in summary, I, th I, th I think we know that it's it's we all of us know um, all of us know uh, the exercise is good for us. We we know that those of you who come here, I think, are, are, are pretty well informed. It's just that we can't find the time. Sometimes we want to know what is actually happening. I hope that maybe some of you here may be involved in the schools or in the local kind of council cover and then get exercise in the schools get exercise in in your associations uh, we've we've done so many things uh, with 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 just telling patients but more needs to be done in the kind of local kind of scene at schools at the at the taman for example uh, people who need more of this advice are not here you know, those of you who are here, most of you understand all of these things already. Okay, thank you very much. This is this is just another picture of of, of, of what I've been doing for the last few years. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Zubin. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for Dr. Zubin, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, my talk today basically is on coronary artery disease and the role of CT cardiac, which is non-invasive angiogram in coronary artery disease. I have uh, a bit of sore throat and running nose, so I will make the uh, presentation as uh, short as possible, informal. If you have any questions, you will keep it till the end. Can I start? <coughs> okay. Heart base is one of the major organs, uh, as uh, all of us know. Uh, there are three major coronary arteries that the heart needs to supply. That will be the right, left LAD, and left main. And CAD, commonly known as heart disease, is the one of the most common uh, heart disease that presents to the hospital. So CAD basically means coronary artery disease. Uh, or ischemic heart disease is the most common presentation of a cardiac problem to the clinic or to the emergency uh, department. Other forms of heart disease will include the valves, abnormal heartbeat, infection, pericardial disease, and congenital heart disease. So the topic today basically is on CAD. This is a slide to show that the heart has a major organ and a various forms of disease that affect the cardiovascular system. So the main topic today is on heart disease or blockage. As I mentioned earlier, is this is the most common presentation to the cardiac clinic or to the emergency department. Patients can be having symptoms or no symptoms. And um, what are the symptoms the patient present with will be most common chest discomfort and or shortness of breath. Patients can also present with a mild heart attack or major heart attack. Patients having no symptoms, how do we detect? What are the tests that we do? Which I'll go through later in the slides. Blockage or atherosclerosis is a process that starts as young as 20 years old and it actually progress over time. And the rate of progression will be faster in certain group of patients with high cardiovascular risk profile or risk factors. 
So the point here is the process start as young as 20 to 30 years old. Hence, uh, it is not uncommon or not impossible to have a patient as young as this age or maybe just after 30 who presents with a heart attack. Not impossible. So we have to think about CAD in this group of patients. Most of us would think in this group of patients, but now we are getting patients as young as this age group. That is the major point of this slide. This is a slide to show that the blockage in one of the artery here in the LAD. And you can see the artery supplying the heart muscle. If the blockage were to get worse one day, the blood supply going down here will be impaired, patient will have chest pain or heart attack. The process of blockage of or atherosclerosis is not organ specific, meaning if it can affect the arteries to the heart, it can also affect arteries to other organs, and most commonly the brain. What are the risk factors that I look for and my colleague look for? Number one, of course, we look at the age, and gender, alphabet B, blood pressure or hypertension. C, cigarette, smoking. C, cholesterol, high cholesterol. And D, diabetes. So you just have to remember B, C, and D. The other risk factors we look at, as I mentioned, is age, your gender, your family history. It doesn't really change much. You can't change it, I can't change it. You are fixed with it. So you just need to concentrate on blood pressure, cholesterol, cigarette, and diabetes. So the first thing you do is stop smoking. Stop smoking, stop smoking. Having said so, I think only one out of ten of my patients ever listen to me. <laughs> maybe one or two, maybe ten or twenty percent. And that's after, after a stroke or heart attack. That's after. Delicious food. And diabetes. So please remember this alphabet, B, C, and D. So the best thing you can do for yourself is this. This slide is to show that a diabetes is a disease where when you see the heart doctors uh, almost immediately put the patient at high risk. Uh, this is also a slide that shows that when a patient has diabetes with no heart disease is equivalent to a patient with known heart disease but no diabetes. Okay, these two slides basically shows that <coughs> sorry, patient with diabetes but no heart disease is the same as a patient with heart disease but no diabetes. So please make sure your diabetes is well controlled. This, you have to see the endocrinologist. I can't help you much on that. So the key thing is high risk equivalent. And uh, these are the things we look for. Uh, target HbA1c and target LDL. The process of atherosclerosis doesn't happen overnight. Happen over months or probably it's actually over years. A patient may or may not have symptoms and one day the plaque decides to rupture. And when the plaque decides to rupture, this is when you will have symptoms, chest discomfort, and likelihood the patient will come to the ER. And if the blockage is worse over this area, the patient will have suffered a heart attack over the anterior wall. So a plaque generally, less than 50%, most of them are unstable. Patients will not have symptoms. 
until the plug decides to burst. When the plug bursts, if the plug bursts, I can't answer you. <coughs> Most of the patients that present with heart attack, the blockage is generally non-critical, less than 50%. And hence, they do not have any symptoms until the plug ruptures. Meaning, if you, you were to go for a stress test, the stress test technically will be negative or normal because the blockage is less than 50%. The plug can be 20-30% narrowing and if you think about it, the, you will not have any symptoms because the flow is still normal. The plug can be unstable. If the plug doesn't rupture, you will not have any symptoms. But if the plug ruptures and there's the sudden a blockage, a total blockage of the arteries, you will have chest discomfort. So most of patients with heart attack, the blockage is generally not significant, but the plug is not stable, and the plug decides to rupture. Any questions so far? It just shows that the most of the blockage is non-significant or non-critical in patients who present with heart attack. So how do we diagnose patients with CAD or heart disease? I think we go through the same template. We go through your history. We go through your symptoms. Uh, especially, do you have any symptoms uh, on exercise? Your exercise tolerance? With your risk profile? Examination? And we have to go through some tests. So the more risk factors you have, which I mentioned earlier, you will fall into the higher risk group. But I need to remind the audience that it doesn't mean that if you have all the risk factors, you have blockage. And it actually doesn't mean if you have none of these, you have no blockage. This is just a guide for us to see what is, what is the likelihood of the patient having blockage or heart disease. There are patients with none of the risk factors mentioned, risk profile, or none. Nil, non-smoker, no symptoms, but they have very significant blockage. <coughs> so as I mentioned earlier, all of these risk factors, no good. First thing you do is, I think this is the fourth time, don't smoke. I don't think the uh, tobacco companies will like me. So how do the uh, patients present? Chest discomfort. It can be chest discomfort at rest. Chest discomfort on exertion, exercise, walking up the stairs. This can happen every month, end of April, is it? End of April or end of May? Anyone understand? End of April, what do we do? Correct. End of April. Other presentation, I mentioned earlier, chest discomfort. It can be arm discomfort. It can be just shoulder discomfort. Neck, jaw discomfort. A bit of difficulty to breathe. Cold sweats. Some patients present with epigastric discomfort, which uh, they think is uh, peptic ulcer disease. So quite a lot of patients, no symptoms until one day. <coughs> there are patients also who present in another manner, in another fashion. They present with a stroke first, but subsequent investigation reveal that they have significant blockage. So these are the tests that we will look through. Um, I think blood tests, we are looking at your uh, cholesterol level your sugar level, resting ECG, heart ultrasound, and an exercise stress test. Other tests would be a, a non-invasive CT angiogram or an invasive angiogram if 
the need arise. I put it on the slide. It doesn't mean it is a routine test. It is when the need arise or there's an indication for either an invasive or non-invasive coronary angiogram. Most of us would just do a blood test, a resting ECG, and an exercise stress test. This is a resting ECG of a patient with a heart attack, which clearly shows abnormality in the anterior or chest lids. Patient with chest pain, and the ECG clear cut shows a acute inferior MI, basically a heart attack. Another patient, <coughs> which shows a ST segment changes in the anterior lids. They suggest a heart attack. Okay, thanks, thanks. So we need to do a resting ECG first. There's a baseline test. And this is the heart ultrasound to assess mainly your heart function. A normal heart ultrasound or normal heart function doesn't preclude or exclude blockage. But if there's something abnormal, it adds additional information. So a normal heart ultrasound does not preclude heart disease. Most commonly we use is a treadmill test or exercise stress test. Um, we will be running the uh, not me the patient will be running the treadmill. <coughs> we will be checking the ECG at various stages. Any symptoms of chest discomfort, the blood pressure, etc. I think most of us will know why it's a stress test. The stress test is not 100% accurate, it's 80% plus accurate. But we still do a stress test first for various reasons. And the most important reason we do a stress test first is anyone has an answer? Or what are the reasons why we do a stress test? Widely available, easily accessible. We just run the patient on the treadmill. The patient current, we stop, spot shoe, acceptable to the public. And the most important factor is cost. Cost effective. I, when I report the stress test, I report if it's normal, has negative. I tend not to use the word normal. When I use the word normal stress test, what would the patient think? What would be your thinking if it's normal exercise stress test? Any answers? Okay, the question is, if the stress test is reported as a normal stress test, is there any blockage? A normal or negative stress test means it's unlikely the patient has any underlying critical blockage, critical or significant stenosis. It does not mean no stenosis or no blockage. Clear? Oh, sorry, blockage. So a normal stress test, my interpretation, does not mean total normality normal or no blockage. That's why I tend not to use the normal, the word normal. I use the word negative. So if you see the word negative stress test or normal stress test, means it's unlikely that there's an underlying significant blockage. But it does not mean no blockage. Clear? So therefore, the stress test it's not 100% accurate, it's up to a certain level, 80% plus. It has to be taken into account the overall profile of the patient, especially the risk profile and the symptoms. Clear? <coughs> Heart ultrasound has mentioned. And if the need arises, especially patients with the abnormal stress test or positive stress test, most of us will advise the patient to go for an invasive 
angiogram, which my colleague has shown, uh, I believe, a couple of pictures of the invasive angiogram previously. Here, patient will be here. This is the x ray tube. Pictures will be here. And this is the left, and this is the right cranial artery. So, this is an invasive angiogram. Basically, it's an x ray of the heart artery. We have to inject some dye into the heart arteries and taking x rays at the same time. This is the gold standard. It will delineate the underlying coronary artery anatomy. It is an invasive procedure. Generally, it's safe, but the procedure has a small amount of risk. This is where a lot of patients they are not keen. It depends how we talk to you. Generally, the procedure is safe, there's a small risk. And quite a lot of patients, I realize, they are not keen because of either the cost or the invasive nature of the procedure or the small risk. Even though some patients clear cut, there are indications for invasive angiogram. And I advise patients for invasive angiogram, these patients still decline. This is where the CT scan can come in. I need to remind the audience that a CT coronary artery is not for every patient. The selection of patients is important. <coughs> this is the same machine that we use to scan other organs, especially the brain for stroke. Just go through briefly, CT scan, one beam, this is the principle, patient will be on the table. Many years ago, we can't do it because uh, it's not fast enough to capture the beating heart. Uh, however, with advancement in the technology, multi-slice and dual source, we are able to capture a beating heart, the heart arteries. The picture of the CT scan of the heart is good enough to interpret for any blockage. But as I said, the selection of the patients is off paramount importance, which I will briefly go through later. <coughs> the first thing we will go through is the calcium score. Calcium score of the heart. And the, uh, the calcium score will be graded into various stages. The cutoff I use is 400. Patient may have a score of 200 plus, 300 plus. I may not proceed. Uh, the reason is, as you can see, the calcium is, this patient's heart artery is heavily calcified. The calcium will appear very bright, something like a bone. And if I were to inject contrast, the contrast is also white. Very difficult for us to interpret. So generally, it cut off. 400 or more, I will just stop at the calcium score. If it's about 200, 300 plus, and the calcification is at certain important or wider locations, I may and probably won't proceed. I will stop there. So these are slides that shows that the cutoff score is a 400. Four hundred. So if Patient heart scan can score more than 400, straight away up high risk. So what are the group of patients that I choose for CT scan? Most commonly is to look for any blockage of heart arteries. So these are the appropriate indications. Patient with low risk, short positive stress test, maybe an acute stress test, meaning the stress test can't be interpreted, but at a lower risk. Or heart muscle disease, I want to rule out any blockage. There are other indications for heart scan, but the, the talk today basically is on detection of coronary artery disease. There are other users of the heart scan, which you can see here. <coughs> Inappropriate indication, Example, patients come with a heart attack. Clear-cut heart attack, patient has symptoms. Abnormal ECG, 
and an abnormal blood test biomarkers, elevated troponin and uh, CKMB. So actually, these patients should directly go to invasive angiogram. Directly straight to invasive angiogram. But there are still this group of patients who refuse. I may consider a, a non-invasive angiogram. In a way, is to convince the patient. If I can prove that there's a significant blockage, he will need this uh, invasive angiogram and subsequent treatment. But actually, the indication is inappropriate. <coughs> what are the risks of cardiac CT? Two things, dye, a contrast, and radiation. So basically, it's a trade-off. We want some coronary imaging and some risk. So, but the risk that we explain for an invasive angiogram, of course, is not the same as a non-invasive angiogram. Because the word already tells you invasive and non-invasive. How accurate is a CT scan? Very much dependent uh, on the quality of picture. So I place a lot of importance on the quality of picture. If the quality of picture is poor, my interpretation will be difficult, hence my accuracy will not be good. There are various factors that I look at before I say, fine, you can go for a CT scan. Um, technician, my radiographer is also important, my nurse is also important, because they will help me to get a good quality picture. If I don't get a good quality picture, no point doing it. But if the picture quality is good and the heart arteries are normal, the accuracy is good enough, 99%. It's almost as good as an invasive angiogram. And the patient stress test is a false positive or the chest pain is non-coronary or non-cardiac. I tell the patients, you don't have to come back to see me anymore. But if there's some stenosis there, very much dependent on the picture quality, any calcification, accuracy won't be as high as 99%. <coughs> this is a patient uh, with a normal CT coronary of the LED and the right coronary artery. This patient, I actually know him. If I recall correctly, he's about 60 plus when he had a CT scan. And that was the first CT scan in a public hospital. So he was one of the first few patients who had the CT scan done for free. He has no symptoms. No symptoms, meaning no chest pain, no shortness of breath. He agreed because there was a starting phase of the CT scan many years ago. But however, he has a risk factor of diabetes and hypertension and smoking. Bracket. Because he smokes somewhere else. Nobody knows. But I can smell it. So he falls into the high risk group, but he has no symptoms, meaning no chest discomfort on exertion. CT scan shows a significant uh, blockage in the distal right. The invasive angiogram confirms that and it underwent angioplasty. In fact, if I recall correctly, he has another blockage on the LED which also stented. I only show the right. <coughs> CT scan which shows a positive remodeling of the heart arteries. Patients after surgery after surgery, and if patients has chest discomfort or abnormal stress tests, we are not sure whether the graft are still patent. Normally, uh, I would subject or ask the patient to go for invasive angiogram and graft study. But if the patient is not keen, CT scan is an option uh, to look at the patency of grafts. It is not a good test to look at the native or origin artery, which most of the time is going to be calcified, but it can be used to assess patency of grafts. <coughs> uh, this shows a patent lima to LED graph here, and a patent uh, graph to the right.
This is a CT scan of a patient with anomalous origin. What it means that the origin or the starting part of the artery comes from an abnormal location. It can't be detected on the stress test. We won't know. Angiogram invasive, yes. Shows that the right cranial artery comes from the left cups. Normally, it will come from the right cups. So, the right normally comes from the right, but the right comes from the left cups. This patient is at high risk of sudden cardiac death. Patient with an enlarged right cranial artery, we call it aneurysmal. To assess patency of stent, CT scan is not a good test to assess patency. Uh, the reason is stents, it depends what stents are used, which most of the time you won't know when patient comes. The stent will appear bright on the CT scan, the dye will be appear bright. In some cases, I will be able to assess the patency of stents, but in some cases, I can't assess because I can't see the lumen itself. But however, this patient, here I can see the stents are clearly patent. Very much dependent on the blooming artifact of the stents, um, how bright is it on the CT scan. But a CT scan, probably not a good test, very difficult to interpret. So if I can see, I can give an answer to the patient. But if I can't see, difficult to tell patient. I only know after doing the test. Another one, patient with stents. These are quite old stents, and the stents are patent. <coughs> Sorry. So most common use of CT scan is to assess the heart arteries, non-invasive angiogram compared to invasive. Uh, other other uh, uses would be to assess the graphs, stents maybe, uh, function, most of the time we use a heart ultrasound. There are other uses of the CT scan, which I mentioned. And the most useful indication is to rule out underlying coronary artery disease in patients in a low risk group. <coughs> what are the issues of CT scan I mentioned earlier? X-ray die not every patient is suitable for a ct scan patients with the abnormal heartbeat uh, atrial fibrillation they are not suitable multiple stents they are not suitable high calcium score they are not suitable patients who can't hear very well they can't do it can't follow command can't do it you can't hold breath you can't do it so the selection is of paramount importance I'll just go through three cases. I'll skip the first one. This patient I've seen many years ago. He has no symptoms. The only risk profile he has is high cholesterol. Uh, an examination, hypertension. Um, blood test shows a uh, high sugar. He is keen for a heart scan, but despite uh, offering a stress test. It falls into a high risk group if I use the Framingham risk score. <coughs> and the CT scan. I just want you to concentrate on this. Here. This is the left anterior descending artery. Here. So there's a significant disease or stenosis or blockage in the mid LED. He has no symptoms. And if I recall correctly, I actually stented the mid LED. Okay, case number three, I saw him last year, 58 years old, no cardiovascular risk factors, no diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, no cigarettes, nil, no symptoms, nil, not a Malaysian. So I asked him, 
why do you come here? You can do it at your home country. <coughs> Answer? All right? It's fair enough for me to ask. You have no symptoms. You have no risk factors. You are not from Malaysia. Why do you come here? Okay. He actually went, underwent a checkup done by my colleague, not me. But the stress test failed. Positive. My colleague actually suggested a CT scan. So I actually did the CT scan, has requested. CT scan, calcium score is only about 50, 60. So I proceeded to the second part of the CT scan. It shows significant disease in the osteo LED all the way down to mid LED. And it is normal after that. This shows significant disease in the proximal mid LED plus significant disease in the mid circumflex. I told him to go back to do an angiogram in his country. But he wanted an angiogram on the same day. So yes, the, I, didn't ha I don't have the picture of the invasive angiogram. The invasive angiogram shows, yes, confirmed, significant disease in the osteum LED here, all the way down to mid. And also a uh, significant disease in the osteum circumflex, which is not seen here but pick up on the invasive angiogram, and of course it confirms the cynical disease in the mid circumflex. I, my opinion to the patient is surgery. Stenting can be done, but it's a bit difficult technically, but possible. But my point here is, something needs to be done. All right? No risk factors. No symptoms. Okay. How many of you all here would actually trust my opinion? You think about it normally first as a, as a patient. No symptoms. Nothing. Actually, he's here for a vocation. So after one day, the doctor tells me I need a surgery, major surgery. How many patients will actually take that? All right. He went for a second opinion somewhere else. So the reason is, if the blockage here, which is really significant, and one day it blocks 100%, there will be no blood going down the LED. The patient will have actually suffered a major heart attack, which means either he comes to the ER, not in a good shape, or he may not make it to the hospital. All right? <coughs> Another patient just recently, if I recall, is about two months or three months ago, engineer, Risk factors only diabetes and hypertension. No symptoms. I was quite surprised. Came to request a CT scan. I don't see a lot of patients coming, you know, requesting this, 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 this. Requesting. By right, he should undergo an exercise stress test first. But the patient requested, I've explained, he wanted it, he agreed for it. <coughs> CT scan shows a subtotal or almost total occlusion in the LED. Subtotal or total, which is confirmed on the invasive angiogram, total occlusion of the LED. There is also significant blockage in the right. I told patient two options, can try angioplasty, may or may not be successful. The other option is surgery. Okay. 
no symptoms. So to summarize, CT scan or CT coronary artery or CT cardiac is a non-invasive coronary angiogram. The word itself is really non-invasive as compared to invasive angiogram. The selection of the patients or the type of patients should be looked through carefully. There are certain factors I look at before I say yes, you can or no, you can't. The reason is if I cannot get a good quality picture, I cannot interpret, then there's no point for me to do the test or subject you to the test. There are some patients, the indication are clear cut for invasive angiogram, doesn't want, they want a CT scan. There are patients who has no indication for a CT scan, they want a CT scan. They don't want a stress test. And the most common reason is this group of patients, they know stress test is not 100% accurate. They want something more accurate. But I have, I have to uh, inform the audience that this is an inappropriate indication. I've already shown you the slide on the indications of a non-invasive angiogram. Subtotal occlusion of the LED. Okay, any questions? I still advocate the use of an exercise stress test first. If patients come to see me, I've seen one before, calcium score of 800, 800 or 1000. Risk factor is only smoking, or smoking or hypertension. Patient has no symptoms. Ended up doing a calcium score, which shows 800, no symptoms. Patient didn't do a stress test. I did a stress test, and the stress test is negative or normal. The patient was told that he has very bad blockage need an angiogram, ask me, uh, see me to, uh, uh, basically asking me to do an angiogram. I did a stress test, the stress test was normal, I say you take medication, go back. Come back in about 12 months for a repeat stress test. But however, if you still want an angiogram, I can do for you. But I need to remind the patient the stress test is negative. Which means that, stop smoking, aspirin, statin. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Would you kindly return to your seat as we prepare the stage for the Q&A session so we can have questions for both the doctors. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question later, please raise your hand and one of my colleagues will pass you a mic. So before you ask a question, please state your name uh, followed by your question and you can also address to one or both the doctors. All right, we're just about ready. May I invite Dr. Zubin and Dr. Liu both onto the stage for the Q&A session. Hi. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Zubin and Dr. Liu. Very interesting session. Okay. The, my question is related to CAD, more the diagnostic. Okay. It links to insurance because insurance companies, they decline claims if it's deemed as pre-existing. So maybe I want to hear your opinion. How, where is the clear definition of pre-existing? Thank you. Pre-existing is a word which I think the company needs to define first. Pre-existing one day, one week, one month, six months, 12 months, I can't answer you. So it, should has uh, I think the company should define pre-existing in terms of duration. I can't answer you that question. Is it days, weeks, or months, or years, or ten years, or twenty years? So the time frame has to be there. 
if and um, I think when they word they use the word pre-existing is if the patient comes to a hospital, example, uh, with giddiness and a very high blood pressure, 200 over 100, the company may ask, is this the pre-existing condition? So the question basically is, do you have hypertension at the time when you bought the insurance? The answer is no, so it's not a pre-existing condition. If the answer is yes, I think the answer is pre-existing condition. So there's a time frame where I can compare on day one of presentation and on the day you bought the insurance. But if your question is that, was the, the blockage pre-existent 10 years ago, I think no one can answer you. It may have been there, it may not have been there. So example, you bought an insurance, let's say two years ago. Do you have very minor blockage of your heart arteries three years ago or two years ago? Possible. I can't answer you. But technically, I, I think it's no. Because at that time, you have no documented or no known heart disease. So the answer should be no. I guess there's, uh, there's some problems uh, which, which states uh, the U.S. Is still having is is having now because their their screening uh, programs are sometimes a bit too extensive, and they detect things like small amounts of plaque, small amounts of calcium in young in young people. And what does this uh, mean to those who who have just planned for insurance? And it can be a problem. I think we face a few patients, one or two patients, where they they. They may get declined. So be be clear why we want to go for a screening program. Uh, you know, there are some reasons for that, but there are some clear kind of patients where you don't really need to if you're very healthy, there's no strong family history. The other one, which uh, which is I think is quite clear, is, is those with congenital uh, diseases, which is you're born with it, you know, hole in your heart, uh, and we've got something which you were born with. So that's that's quite clearly something which is not related to to, heart, to, to the heart disease that we are talking about, CAD. But uh, you know, nobody can, as as you said, like this, I don't think we can know when did the heart disease start. The, uh, the whole process starts quite early, you know, 20, 30 years. Not every abnormality that we detect is clinically significant. Example, patients come for a checkup on heart ultrasound, we find a very mild mitral regurge or tricuspid regurge. It is normal on my part, meaning not significant, should not impair the patient in the future. Unfortunately, the insurance company only want to see one word, normal. Example, if a patient has very bad acne, the face is scarred. Is that normal or not normal? Yeah, so let's say patient has a lot of pimples, scarring, pus, is that normal or not normal? So that's not normal, okay? But insurance, normal. So same thing, if I get a patient very mild TR, mild MR, to us it's normal, meaning it's not significant. But unfortunately, some of them don't take it. I've asked before, they can't answer me. Example, patient 35 or 40 comes to see me. Uh, unfortunately, he is losing a lot of hair. Normal or not normal? Pardon? Normal. <laughs> not normal. 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 I can't answer. Okay. So I did ask the insurance company before. Patient who has no hair, do you accept them for insurance? None of them can answer me. Patient who has very bad scarring of the face from acne. 
Do you take them? They kept quiet. Anyone answer me? So Ma TR or Ma Emma to me and pop to my colleague, we accept it. No implication. Continue with your work. But unfortunately, they still want to get an explanation. Can we have the question from the gentleman, Red? We'll come round here in a bit. Okay. I've got two simple questions. Very simple. Number one is, uh, now, about coffee. I like to drink coffee. Okay. Do, does coffee, if you drink more than three uh, cups uh, a, uh, a day, uh, does it got have any implication on the heart attack or what? Uh? And then number two, uh, if uh, a person has done three stands, uh, you know, the, the three arteries, uh, will it be, what? The, how long will it last? And if, will there be an, another second attack uh, or not of the stands uh, if you have done? To any of the doctors, thank you very much. I'll answer the first question. I think uh, it's already 10.30. I've, I've had about three espressos this, since th this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and there's probably more hemoglobin, eh, sorry, there's more, there's more caffeine in my blood than hemoglobin. And I can't function without coffee. Uh, but that's a personal thing, okay? So there's been, there's been research for so long and so many kind of conflicting data on coffee. And up to a certain stage that doctors ourselves are debating, I think we need to stop researching about coffee. That's one. Uh, what is clear is uh, if, you, if, you, if you have, you know, su super cut manis and, you know, creamer and also sugar, it makes sense that please don't take too much you know, coffee because we have that as well. But on itself, caffeine seems safe for most patients, even those, those with irregular heartbeats, it may not do anything. Okay, but again, it's a personal thing. Uh, there is, uh, the other thing is, is, is in, in somebody who uh, has got very high you know, cholesterol or you know, lipids, uh, too much coffee may just release extra you know, lipids into the bloodstream. Uh, that was one of the first drugs used for sports, sports doping. It, was caffeine. It just gives you that extra, uh, that extra kick uh, for the second wind. But uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's at high doses. So caffeine should be safe. One or two, three, five, seven should be safe. <laughs> okay. this, is, this is the research which I read. You know, somebody else m might say it's dangerous, but maybe they are reading something else. So this, I think it's split in the middle. But I think you have to be reasonable about it. Lah. If you take coffee plus Red Bull plus Coke plus you don't sleep, that may be asking for trouble. You know, so as, as long as you don't have the other stuff. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, second, uh, second question was about stents. Yeah, so we can only fix the heart as good as what we are faced with. Okay? If I have a bad engine uh, that I need to send to the mechanic, my 15-year-old, no, my 10-year-old van, the Innova, I want it to become a uh, Honda Odyssey. I don't think he can do it. Okay, so we are faced with a bad vessel, then we might not get a stand which will last too long. One, if you have a nice clean vessel and it's only a short area which is tight, then it may last a long time. So again, depends on what we are faced with. But then we have some other things such as Lots of calcium, had uh, you know, kidney disease. If the patient still smokes, okay. If the patient still smokes, these things may not last as long as possible. We've got patients who their stents have lasted as long as 10, 12, 13 years. But I think our patients, on average, about eight years. Ten years is is good. Twelve years, I'm very proud. He will be the kind of patients that I tell my other patients. You know, but most of them, about yeah, seven, eight years. Is that right? Yeah. And then things happen. The most, import the most important thing after stand, number one, make sure you take your medication, aspirin and statin. Number two, 
Stop smoking, stop smoking, stop smoking. Number three, don't assume the stents are forever patent. It may not be the case. Generally, it can last maybe up to 10 years, some maybe 15, 20 years. Very difficult answer to answer you. One of the ways that I assess clinically is by your symptoms, whether you have any symptoms or exercise stress tests. Every 12 months or maybe 12 to 18 months. Yeah, so it depends on what we see on the angiogram uh, which has happened to that stent. Uh, if you put in two or three stents, it may not be on all three vessels. We have to look at the other vessels as well. Uh, there may be some worsening of the vessels which was not touched the last time. Uh, so if there's a re-narrowing of that vessel, a few things can be done. Obviously, one is bypass surgery. Second is just putting a, say a balloon to reopen that vessel. A second stent can be done, but the second procedure is normally harder, and you are left with two layers of of kind of metal work now. So there's 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 more things that there's less time that these stents can last because it, there's a second layer. So a few things can be done. We do see uh, lots of patients who have come for a third, second time, and it's not because of their uh, their fault. It's just because of the disease, the the, uh, the the disease process. So a lot of things can be done. Uh, we may just have have to uh, accept that after delaying bypass surgery for five, ten, twelve years, at this stage, the second time, that may be what the patient needs. Uh, the first question, uh, the second question is, uh, you know, the, the other thing which I was talking about is, uh, I want to talk about is uh, for exercise. So if you've had a stent and you get your level of activity exercise up to a high level and then you get symptoms, then that may be the reason why uh, you have the symptoms. That means there's reaccumulation of of the plaque uh, inside the stent. So if we don't do anything after uh, you know, stenting, then we don't have that, that change in how much we can do. Somebody who has got a heart stent, they go for exercise three, four Ks in, in one day, for example, and after about four, five years, they say, I can't do that three Ks anymore. And that may be a sign for him to go to see a doctor and then we can check. So just getting the activity back on, uh, it's very important. Your, your first question is we have to forward it to the Starbucks, San Francisco Coffee, etc. Yeah. All right, thank you, doctors. Let's uh, take a question from over there as my colleague comes around here with the mic. We start with this question first. Yeah. Good morning, doctors. Uh, my question is, uh, a patient has uh, undergone a stress test and the result is abnormal heartbeat. Recommended for a CT scan, the CT scan says that there are four blocks of 50% each. Then after that, went for an endogram invasive and the final result was uh, one block 30%, second block 20%, third block zero, fourth block uh, can't be, uh, cannot identify, that means cannot find the block. So my question is, how come after three tests, the results are totally different? It causes much anxiety to the patient. My question is, when do you do the test? <laughs> okay, what are your risk profile? Why do you do a stress test first? Remember my slides. What are your risk profile? Do you have under, underlying cardiovascular risk factors? Diabetes, hypertension, smoking, cholesterol. First question. Second question, why do you go for a stress test? Is it for a checkup or you are not well, having symptoms? Okay, number three. Abnormal heartbeat during stress test is a bit difficult for me to answer. It depends what is the abnormal heartbeat. Is it just a ventricular ectopic extra heartbeat or is it atrial fibrillation or flutter? Can't answer you that because I have to see the ECG tracing myself. But if there's no ST segment changes during the stress test, uh, for me, I will actually stop at that. 
on the CT scan. Very simple. Quality of picture, quality of picture, quality of picture. I only can interpret on what is done, reconstructed, and presented to me. So that's why if you recall my presentation just now, I place a lot of importance on the selection of patient, my supporting staff to get a good quality picture. If the quality of picture is poor, and that's where the problem comes, the interpretation and hence the accuracy of the CT cardiac. We tend to overestimate the severity of the blockage on CT scan. Generally, we tend to overestimate. And if you recall what I told you just now, it is a good test to negate. Basically, it is a good test with negative value, meaning if your heart arteries are normal or, or essentially normal, my accuracy is high. If there's blockage, my accuracy tends to come down a bit and we tend to may overestimate the stenosis. Hence, that's why you go to number three, your angiogram. Okay, uh, doctor, I'd uh, like to ask your, uh, answer your questions. Actually, it's annual, uh, annual checkup. Lah. Okay. Second thing, whether the picture is quality or not quality, I cannot answer because still can see. I mean, I, I'm not an expert to see. I know, I know you okay. can't answer. I know uh, you can't answer because you are okay. a patient. Okay. Uh, but the final, the final result is no problem. You, are just, uh, you can go example, for exercise. Let me show you. During the CT scan, the patient is supposed to hold breath for about 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, 10 to, to 15 seconds, totally no movement at all. Why? patient is not supposed to move at all. If the patient move, if the artery is like this, I know the patient move. Because it's impossible for the patient to be alive in front of me with the artery like this. Understand? What if you move like this? So it will appear has a significant blockage on the CT scan. You understand the concept now? So if I get this picture, I have to report it as significant blockage. But actually, it's due to a movement artifact. So this is one of the setbacks of CT scan. If the picture is like this, I know the answer is normal. The patient move. And on the raw data, I will see a line across. Very obvious. Issue is, is it movement? Or is it blockage? Yeah, so a CT scan uh, for a lot of patients, it acts as a gate, a kind of gatekeeper, uh, just to make sure that there's nothing serious there because of some atypical symptoms, uh, some funny tests on the stress test, and then we have to just make sure that it's not something serious. Uh, you know, and, and the screening programs because of work, uh, you know, reasons. There, there's some plus and minus from that. We've, we've, we've heard you know, family members, our own colleagues, uh, there's, you know, they find something there in the scan or an ultrasound. How much do you want to go ahead? It's, 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 it's part of going to a hospital. If we can avoid it as much as possible, as in going to that, uh, that spiral, then we, we're happy to have that kind of way. But in some patients, we just need to go on and see, just make sure it's nothing serious. Most patients will want to know if it's something serious and we do have to discuss uh, beforehand. If we s if do a test, we'll find something. It may be something which has been there for a long time. It's not causing any disease. But again, a CT scan is, is never perfect. Uh, I think we all agree on that. Uh, 
Uh, good morning. My name is Poon. I'm happy that Star People and then Aradama Medical have this talk. Okay, uh, my question will direct to Dr. Liu. Uh, okay, uh, for a female patient, age 81, who has history of uh, hypertension, irregular heartbeat, then she suffered a mild heart attack. The question will relate to whether such a patient is suitable to uh, go for an angiogram test or procedure. So the patient is on the blood thinner. So uh, my question is whether such a person having uh, weakness in the lower limb, maybe on wheelchair, could uh, uh, endure the angiogram procedure or test. Thank you. Okay. To summarize, 81 years old lady, abnormal heartbeat, I would assume is atrial fibrillation, uh, CAD because of a di a, uh, diagnosed information of a mild heart attack, and the patient is wheelchair bound. Am I right? But then I can't hear. Wow, all right. So 81 years old lady, wheelchair bound. How far does the family want to go? How much do you want the doctors to do? Quality of life, number one. Life expectancy, number two. Okay. The indication for angiogram is there. Invasive, not non-invasive, because you mentioned heart attack, mild heart attack. So mild heart attack, ACS, is an indication for invasive angiogram, not CT or non-invasive angiogram. I still go back to the fact that she is 81 years old, wheelchair bound, life expectancy, quality of life, any other pre-existing medical condition that may impair the quality of life or life expectancy, expectation of the family. If the family, a patient wants all the way out, is actually an indication for invasive angiogram, not CT scan. Likelihood, she is not a suitable candidate for CT scan. 81 years old, a bit unlikely she can hold breath for 10 to 15 seconds. Number one. Number two, the likelihood is that at this age, there will be significant calcification and therefore impair the picture quality and hence my accuracy. Number three, she has suffered a mild heart attack, no, no CT scan, straight to invasive angiogram. Sorry, we have time for one last question. Can we pass, uh, pass the mic to the gentleman in white here? Sorry, sir. My name is Jordan Tan. I just want to ask a question. Now. How does a GP become a cardiologist? What are the things they learn before they become uh, certified to be a cardiologist? That's one question. <laughs> Number two is, uh, I like Dr. Liu's uh, closing slide on uh, a superior doctor is the one that helped prevent the disease. And I think the, one of the major uh, topics that was uh, not covered was how does a heart, uh, the artery become narrowing and hardening the blood vessel? How does it happen? As it do a lot with the diet, nutrition, more than uh, what the doctor is doing, you know, uh, to, to uh, correct the defects that already happened in my intestine. Yeah, so most GPs don't, uh, they don't become a cardiologist because once you're out there in the clinic kind of uh, sector, you're already probably five years, eight years down the line in your training. So. Uh, most doctors who want to become a cardiologist, they start early, uh, three or four years from graduating, and then uh, they go to either the three usual ways of training in this country. Either you go to the university, you go to the Ministry of Health, or you go to IGN, uh, the, the three main ways. But how, how does uh, the heart vessel uh, get narrowed? There's multiple factors, and there's nearly no one patient uh, which gets heart disease because of one reason. 
Uh, number one is always age. Age is the most consistent risk factor for heart disease. Just by being slightly, you know, a bit more senior than, than, than you were five years ago, you get an extra risk. Then the usual things, uh, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, cigarette smoking. And, uh, but now we are seeing more lifestyle things. Uh, that means if we have a family history of heart disease, our uncles, parents, 60, 70 years old, we always see the second generation younger. So lifestyle things like not, not moving and exercise and diet, it's, it's, it's multiple factors. Okay. The, uh, you did mention this, the last slide on superior doctors. It, it's very, <coughs> sorry, very difficult, very difficult to convince patients that the patient needs certain treatment, especially when you are asymptomatic. You have no symptoms and you just come for a checkup. Very difficult. And I find they have a cert certain mindset. And which I'll show you one case. The last, the, um, the I think the second last case, the patient has no symptoms. Forced to do a checkup by the doctor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your questions. I know there are a couple more we couldn't get to. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, but uh, the doctors do need to make a move urgently. So thank you very much for joining us here today. And a round of applause for Dr. Zubin and Dr. Liu. So that concludes today's Star Life session. Please remember to pass us your feedback forms on the way out. Thank you and have a pleasant day ahead.